Welcome to the Digital Agency Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Englander. Morgan, great to have you on the show. Great to be here. Yeah, for sure. So you are in lovely San Francisco, Silicon Valley. I'm in New York. And also you have a very strong background in the startup world, which I think is in an interesting, perhaps chaotic place. And we'll hopefully get into all of that and, and more you know, of your journey building Firebrand. I guess before we do that, would you mind kind of talking a little bit about your background from a high level and how you got here? Great. Thank you. Well, my name is Morgan McClintic. I'm the CEO of Firebrand. It's a startup marketing agency, and we help them raise their awareness and drive demand. We do that through integrated programs involving PR and content marketing and digital marketing. It's a boutique. There's about 25 of us headquartered in San Francisco, but with a team uh, across the country. But I started my agency career in the UK, as you can probably tell from my accent. I'm a Brit. I joined a small agency in London at the time. There were just 10 of us at the early stages of tech PR, and that's my background. We grew that. It was an entrepreneurial agency. We managed to grow it up to be the biggest in by revenue in the UK. But it was still small at that time, that sector. And this was 96. And so I, I then I came over five years later, came over to the US and helped establish their operations over here. And when I left, we had, so I joined when we were 10 people. I left when we were about 600 people. About half of those people were in the US. Revenues were about 75 million overall. And again, about half of that was over here. And as part of that journey, we built it organically, which was great. And then we also acquired three other agencies. So we had a, a lot of fun with that, with that firm. And then I went on to found Firebrand. We've been going for about seven years. Yeah, that makes sense. And what seven years ago, like what, what made you want to strike out on your own? Like what were you looking to build as an agency at that time? Well, you know, I think you can do it once and you're lucky and twice you're good. So I think there's always something to prove. And I joined an agency, which was already, I mean, it was small, 10 people, but it was, you know, still going. And I wanted to sort of see if we could do it again, plus sort of just being entrepreneurial and liking that. And, but this agency, we only wanted to work with startups. My last agency would work with not just tech companies, lots of different sectors, lots of different countries, and this firm only work with startups. Plus, it's just a lot of fun. I think the early stages of building an agency are great. As you get bigger, things become more complex. It takes a different skill set. So we just wanted to uh, have another go at it. Yeah, that makes sense. And let's talk about startups a little bit. I guess what made you kind of hone in on startups as a niche? And what do you like about marketing startups? And what do you not like so much about marketing startups? <laughs> well, look, I, you know, if, I think our lives, if you think about our lives now compared to generations before are immeasurably better on almost any dynamic, you know, healthcare, education, personal safety, longevity. And that's because we as humans are innovative and we're always trying to make tomorrow better than today. And there's really no place like the tech sector is one of the most innovative, changing people's lives, I think largely for, for the better. And if you want to be involved in that, startups are, by their very nature, hugely disruptive and innovative. And just being part of that as a marketer is a, is a big privilege and is exciting to kind of have that sort of front row seat and being able to sort of make, make things better. Now, look, startups are, by their nature, quite small. And so some of the sort of challenges of working with startups are, you know, you've got limited resources, they're often changing their strategy, changing their plans, you know, and, and evolving, pivoting the whole, the whole business compared to a larger organization that might be more measured, more planned, have more resources, more people have more brand recognition already. So you're building on a bigger, a bigger platform. But if you work with a startup, you are working with the CEO, with the founding team, and you can have a huge impact on their future. Like every marketing program that you implement, it matters. Things, you know, you might not get it right, but you have to evolve and 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 it's got to work, right? Because you've got to raise their awareness. You've got to drive demand. They need to be able to grow to make their technology have the impact that it, it potentially could. It's not, not good enough just to have a great invention. You've actually got to market it to make it uh, reach its audiences. And so being part of that is just great fun. And plus a startup is going to work faster and that sort of fast and furious part is just 
great for an agency. You get to try lots of new marketing uh, techniques. So we just want to be at the at the heart of all that. Yeah, it's super interesting. But I, I agree, and I kind of consider myself, you know, a technological empiricist to use the big word, where technology is the horse that's leading the cart, right? If you think about the cultural landscape of the 20th century, it's largely because of television and because of the car mm-hmm. and because of these, it's because of technology. And then the culture follows, the economy follows that, culture follows that, politics follows the culture and so on and so forth. How do you feel about the future of technology? Are you optimistic? How does AI fit into that? And to frame that out a little bit more, it seems like there's a lot of negativity around technology. Peter Thiel has the famous line where it's like, name the last movie that portrayed technology in a positive light that came after Back to the Future. And it's really, really hard to find one. So where do, where does that leave you? Right. I mean, we're living in a bit of a tech lash right now, whether it's face recognition or our fears about artificial in- intelligence. I mean, fundamentally, I am an optimist. And I do think that uh, on balance, the technological innovations that we've had have improved people's lives. And I think if you look back, that's proven to be the case. But you take something like AI, it is super exciting. We are living in a moment, like there are certain pivotal moments, the iPhone and uh, which sparked a whole bunch of mobility, the cloud, what have you, that changed the way businesses operate and there are winners on that and there are people who are disrupted and ai definitely fits into that sort of into that paradigm we're at the very early stages of that change which will no doubt dominate over the next five to ten years and we'll get things wrong but i think it's hugely it's hugely exciting to be part of that if you think about from a digital agency perspective social media came around and suddenly you could dis- you know disintermediate between a brand and its audience and its audience and reach directly to them and those individuals could also communicate with their other customers and so it was a huge opportunity and a huge threat at the at the time and people who were early into that people at the very early stages of their careers were able to be the specialists in that space and build their whole career and their whole, in fact, agency just on that change. And now here we are with AI, where for most of us, none of us have got years of experience. Like it's not necessarily new technology, but for most of us, it's new. We haven't been using ChatGPT for a long time. You could come into that knowing how to use a particular type of technology, knowing the prompts, etc., and be the expert in your agency. You could found a new agency that is AI first and really leverages those technologies, and that could give you a distinct advantage. And I think that's just exciting to be part of. And you could stand on the side and try not to be part of it, but it's going to disrupt you eventually anyway. Yeah, makes sense. And and I think tied to that is how would you describe the situation on the ground right now in Silicon Valley? What's it like out there? <laughs> well, it's pretty tough right now. In general, the tech sector, the startup sector sort of is an advance of the broader economy. And so I would say in B2B, and my we mainly focus on B2B, there are more B2B startups. We're in a recession on that. And I mean, if you look back to the pandemic, there was a huge explosion of new tech companies as businesses needed to, you know, a horrible phrase, but digitally transform. That created a huge opportunity for technology companies to sell their products. And VC money came into that to take advantage of it. At the same time, interest rates were almost nothing. So you had this explosion and a couple of amazing years where there were a lot of new startups and a lot of new technologies born. Valuations were too high as a result of that. But then interest rates came up started, and inflation came up and the economy started to sort of cool. And it turns out that and so it was harder to get the next round of funding. And so right now it is hard to get the next round of funding. A lot of tech startups sell to other technology companies. So you had this sort of cooling effect. The year of efficiency with Facebook and the public stock markets, everyone had overhired. So they pulled back on that. We're still seeing layoffs. So right now, a lot of startups are still have that sort of valuation in their mind when they're fundraising. 
back in the heyday of 18 months ago. So it is hard to fundraise for B and C round companies they st- you know, to get the good valuation. So a lot of them are tightening their belts, right? They are deciding how can we do more with less battening down the hatches, knowing that probably, you know, just the, the Fed is not going to reduce its interest rate for a while, which means there's plenty of other places that people can put their money. The, the limited partners in VC firms have got other options. And so we're probably going to see this situation go on for a while. And actually, this might be normal, right? The party has sort of stopped. We might be getting back to more balanced valuations, and a more sort of you have to earn it but the, you know it's a lot i would say a lot of do more with less is the vibe right yeah. now but we're hoping for it to lift in you know in q1 as a as i say i'm a i'm an optimist not an economist but uh, yeah, sure. certainly not this quarter yeah it makes sense and i guess with that in mind we all know about open ai and and the other big ai players and the stuff going on there Thinking about the B2B world and things that you can talk about, you don't talk about any mm-hmm. specific companies, but what else is going on out there that people might not know as much about? Is there anything that you think is particularly interesting that should get more attention these days in terms of, of tech products or technological development? I think the game is all about AI. I'd love to be able to say, hey, there's this secret thing that nobody knows about. Yeah. You know, probably things like a Zempic are more going to have a bigger impact, right? But every company is linking what they do to AI in order to garner some kind of increased valuation. And how? And by by AI, I'm talking about the generative AI, not necessarily the sort of predictive machine learning AI that we've had for a long time. And so everyone's laddering up to that. You've still got this normal beats of cybersecurity. There are always more threats. There's always more investment in that. That's always evolving. They're always seeing more things go to the cloud, more things go mobile. But the game is all about AI and its implications. So, you know, AI is applied to computer vision. And so that could be face recognition or object detection or anything like that that can speed, I don't know, baggage handling in an airport. So, or passenger going going through and boarding planes, how do we make sure that that's safe and non-biased and ethical, et cetera? So there are pockets of innovation, but it all ladders up in you know, all companies are trying to sort of, what is your AI story? That's what they're focused on. Right. That makes sense. To shift gears a little bit, I think, you know, we have this kind of cliche view of Silicon Valley from the Facebook story, from, you know, the, the what I'm blanking on the name, the, the, the social, social network, network. Yeah. right, where they're, where he's basically just tossing aside the idea of a traditional agency or the idea of some like outside guru helping them. And it's all about this, the, the growth hacker mindset. How yeah. has that evolved over the years? Like, what, what do you think the, the view of agencies is like in Silicon Valley now versus 1996 and throughout the, the years? <laughs> well, so. look, yeah, I think it's much better. Before, I think agencies were seen as a bit of a vendor, as a supplier. You know, I'm hiring you to do a job, go and do it. And, uh, you know, you're replaceable and I'll get you to do it as cheaply and as quickly as possible. And the pandemic changed that radically because we all it was a complete leveler we all work from home we all saw each other's cats and kids and bedrooms and we know it was just made it much more personal right and so now i think companies work with their agencies much more as a partner not universally but much more as a partner much more personal and you have the technology too to make that process much more multiplayer i mean you might open a Google Doc and work together to write, I don't know, let's say it's a press release or any kind of blog post with the client and they're in there editing it and it's you're not sending things back and forth. So it's, you're doing this job together. And so I really think that's made a big, it's much better. It's made a big difference. At the same time, there are so many more agencies now. The big agencies I don't necessarily have an advantage. If you're a huge global enterprise, you have to go with a huge agency. But I do think that companies are very happy to work with smaller creative teams, 20 people that can deliver a very specific and be the best in the world at that particular task. And again, so I think if you're working in an agency or running an agency, that's a huge uh, opportunity because you've got better clients and you can work with almost any company. 
And so that's usually changed, uh, you know, from when, you know, he used to turn up in a suit and tie and drive to a meeting and then present something. And it was very sort of formal. Yeah, that, that makes sense. To kind of like keep keep shifting gears and kind of get to the micro a little bit and how, how you've built this agency. We had David Ronitsky on the show a while back. You might know he's in your neck of the woods, mm-hmm. focused on the technology mm-hmm. space from 3Q. And he kind of described the entrepreneur's job is to basically fire yourself from jobs. <laughs> and can you talk about oh, that yeah. a little bit? Like, do you think about it that way? And if so, how have you gone about kind of rising through the ranks of your own agency or firing yourself from different things you're doing? Yeah, I mean, look, it's a great privilege to be able to work your way out of a job. You know, you don't want to be kicking every ball as the CEO of a, of a company. I mean, necessarily, when you start, there's you and maybe a few others eventually. So you have to do all the different things. But what you want to do is bring in experts. Those don't have to be in your company. So for example, for our company, you know, my last agency, we had a large finance team and they were amazing. And we had an IT team and they were brilliant people too. In this agency now, we outsource that. We don't need, we have great partners in those areas and they are the best in the world at doing what they do. And so we don't need to be able to hire and train and motivate an IT team or a, or a bookkeeping team. Then within the actual agency itself, what's the expression, hire great people and get out of the way, you know, try to put people in there so that they can then, you know, they know what they're trying to do uh, and you set clear goals and you set the sort of cultural tone and then give them the resources that they need and unlock their sort of entrepreneurial vision. And as long as it aligns with yours, that sparks things you're getting there in a way that you would never normally get there but making sure that they are motivated and underlined our agency has different practices right pr and content marketing and digital and even within digital seo people and paid media people and marketing ops are diff- like oh, actually different types of skill sets and it would be very easy for those to kind of become balkanized tribes and in many agencies you see that right the the, there's one function one team one practice that sort of feels like the stepchild and has its own sort of tribe but if you're trying to deliver an integrated experience to the client the client doesn't see that they don't care that it's an internal pnl they only want one integrated program so we've worked very hard to make sure that People are sort of, you know, T-shaped or pie-shaped, is it sort of with different, different, different strengths across, so that they can actually move from practice to practice, and you get that much more sort of integrated idea. So that the like the PR team could be working on one, like a product launch, and you can actually thinking about different elements of that and spark a whole chain of activities for the client, which takes a lot of a lot of the thinking away from them. So keeping the PNL set, you know, not ha- it's very easy to kind of go, okay, here's a separate PNL for each team. And that just builds those tribes into your agency. And I think, you know, it's good to be aware of the cost centers, but it's bad for a client and cultural perspective. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and with that in mind, and I've gotten some insight into this from us working together, but can you talk about your BD process a little bit and where you fit into that versus the rest of the team and then how that affects the tribalism or hopefully avoiding that mm. tribalism based on the mm. clients you're identifying mm. and winning and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I think, I think it's like, let's just start with why does a company hire any agency, right? You know, we're working together. So you have the same sort of dynamic, right? There are sort of four things. One is they're sort of outsourcing labor, right? They could do it, but they want you to do it. That's the sort of lowest common practice. You could, you could be replaced by anybody else. The next part of it is you have a specific expertise. We know how to do something that the client does not know how to do. Could be Google Ads. Google Ads is a com- complex platform. It's got lots of knobs and buttons to press. They don't know how to do it. If you're spending money. They don't want to make a mistake. They outsource that. Fine. There are lots of companies that could do that too. So that's, but you know, it's important. The third part would be connections. We know people that you don't know. And so from a PR agency, hey, we know media or analysts or what have you. But from a technology agency, it could be, hey, we're a partner of this technology company, right? Could be HubSpot, for example. We're a HubSpot partner and we get advantages that you don't get. So that's good. The client can't get that themselves. And then the top sort of part of that will be creativity. And so we have ideas, we have strategic knowledge that you don't know, right? So 
you know, in the example of sales schema, you've written a book, right? And you, you know something that your clients don't know. And obviously you've packaged some of that up. But, you know, for most agencies, hey, we've got ideas for ad creative or PR for a PR strategy and PR pitches. So you've got to sort of combine those sort of four things, you know, outsource the labor, we've got the expertise, we've got the connections, and we've got the creativity and a client looking for those, those things. And so we try and talk about, make sure that we're hitting those. When I think about a new client, we very much think of like, are we the best agency for them? Let's be candid about it. Are we the best in the world for this company? And are they going to be a great client for us? I mean, most agencies are going to have some kind of qualification checklist, of course. But being candid about, I'd love to be good at this, but can I actually do it? Because you don't want to sign up a client on a hope and a prayer that you'll work it out. Sure, I see that. But, you know, you want to be confident about being able to deliver because otherwise you're signing up a client you're going to have for three, six months, and then they're going to churn and your bucket is, is leaking, right? And you're building a bad reputation for yourself. So I think right up front, part of our process is often your default should be no, we are probably not the right agency for you. Then that really clears away a lot to be able to focus on to say a big yes to the ones that, hey, you know, we really want to work with you and we can really do it. And we've done this before. And that means you're focusing all your effort on the big yeses. And that means you need to talk to a lot of different companies. And so from our perspective, where are those companies coming from? They're coming from outreach that we do with you. They're coming through our content marketing that we do and our own marketing I don't know, efforts, might be paid media or what have you, all the different good things, the email marketing, what have you. And they're also coming through referrals. And so those are former clients, former employees. We just signed up a new client from somebody who left to be a, a marketing position. They're coming from who other influencers. And in our instance, that might be venture capitalists and other tech companies who like HubSpot or demand base who might refer business to us because we can help their customers be yeah. successful. Then you're really narrowing in on, okay, we've got a good large number of companies. We're saying no to a lot of them to be able to say yes, not in a nasty way or an arrogant way, but to be able to say a big yes to the ones we want. And then you're into the conversation and they're not buying me as a the founder of the agency. They're buying the team. And so the sooner you can get your team in front of the client in whatever format that is, is it a pitch? Is it just a conversation? The better, because they want to see the culture and they want to see the people that they're working with. Because to my earlier point, you're working with these people every day and it's a very close relationship. Yeah, I think I think those are all really good points and I couldn't agree more. And just to give you guys a, a big plug, I think one thing that, I th that you did that's really cool, that's kind of like a purple cow is building a little mini e-commerce store on the site where you can buy Firebrand swag, which is like, yeah, there yeah. it is, like swag you want to wear. You know, it actually <laughs> looks cool. And I, I just feel like the bar is so low for just doing anything differently and just being creative on the marketing front or practicing what you preach. And can you talk about that a little bit? Like what inspired it? And do you use what? that in the sales process? How does it Well, come right. Yeah, I look, we so it's very simple. We go to just, you know, we have a store, you can go onto the Firebrand store and it's WooCommerce based. And there are companies that sort of drop ship branded swag. So any company could do this. They don't, but it's quite straightforward. We thought it was fun. Frankly, I borrowed that. Most good ideas are borrowed and history is, you know, we'll, we'll show that. And I borrowed that idea from a former client a company called Splunk. And we worked with them and they took them public and they were recently just bought by Cisco, but they were famous for their t-shirts and the former CMO used to be called the chief t-shirt officer. And they you used to see them walk, but they were, it was swag. They had great little sort of strap lines across them and people would voluntarily wear them and you would see them at conferences and, you know, just at the weekend. And so I think it's nice to be able to give that for us. Look, we send them to people as a thanks. We give them to clients, people join and they can go in the store and buy all the stuff. It makes them feel, you know, the staff makes them feel more welcomed. It's very easy. It's a relatively low cost thing to do. But it's just one example of, you know, something that any agency could do just because the technology is much easier now to be able to do something like that. And it's, and you know, you don't have to, but it's just fun. And I think people see that. 
Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you've been able to make that work well as a, as a general, you know, startup focused agency, but it's like, if you're an e-commerce agency, it's a no brainer. You're selling e-commerce brands that shows that you can, Just you understand it. So hundred percent it makes a lot of sense. That's great. And I think one thing that, that I know you guys have done to grow is focused on, on acquisitions. And can you talk about that mm -hmm. a little bit? How have you been identifying acquisition targets? How are you thinking about yeah. that in the process? Yeah. Yeah. So Firebrand as a 25 person company is too small to make acquisitions would probably be more on the sort of target side. My last agency as a, as a sort of more global mid-sized firm, we did three acquisitions and we bought the first one was about was sort of social media agency of about 30 people. Then we bought a more generalized PR and marketing agency in Boston of about 65 people and an award-winning design, web design shop down in San Diego it was about 45 people. So, so we've done it three times. Each is different, but the process was fairly the same. We engaged like an M&A, specialist M&A, investment banking firm who went out to come up with a long list of target companies. Here's the kind of company that we want talk to them to see, you know, come up with a short list and see who who might want to sell, right? And and as an agency principal, we often get approached by PE firms or other agencies, like this is just part of the game. And you've got to get one that's the right, it's a timing thing. You then have a conversation with, you know, a handful, quite a, you know, it's a bit like new business in many ways, right? You have to talk to a number because we're all different. We have different cultures, different expertise, you know, different, are we, you know, they're always good because agency principals love getting on with other agency principals. We've all got scars like that scene in Jaws where we're all sharing our, yeah, our scars on the, on the back of each other, right? You're going to have, but do you want to work with these people all the time? Are they really going to fit? And so that quickly sort of, you come down to two or three in any one process that you you think could happen. You move into some kind of letter of intent. You have to talk about the money and the process. There are different ways of valuing businesses. Ours happen to be based on a multiple of a bit da over a certain period of time. And you know, you're playing with what is that multiple and what goes into a bit da? and do I get the money up front or is it an earnout? Or like there are levers to press, but you basically have to get the pricing right my advisor on that sort of said it's a bit like gravity right once you've got it right everyone feels good if it's off everyone's a bit sort of seasick because we don't want to overpay because we're going to feel like we've got to get more juice out of this deal and equally if you're selling your agency you don't want to be underpaid for this and feel like you're being not getting the value of all the effort that you put in the late nights so get that right okay and then we you know you have there's an spa a, a sell, sell and purchase agreement where the attorneys all have a lot of good fun arguing over terms of things that might not happen and it's at that point that the sort of love any it's a completely prophylactic experience any rapport or love that you've built up goes out the window because the attorneys are saying hey but what if this went wrong and you know that might happen let's hope not you have to normally sort of step out and go okay you know i think on all of them there was a moment in the deal making process where i had to step out with the other principal and walk around the block and go look are we going to do this or are we not and how let's let's talk you know one on one and then the deal sort of happens and all this, that, this. But it's, I think the most important thing is the integration plan. Like, how are we actually, we did ours up front. How are we actually going to work together? What clients have we got? How are we going to improve our proposition? And, you know, a lot of the challenge of that tends to come down, though, I will say, to the team and HR benefits and the details of that. Because, hey, you know, I don't know, nobody wants something taken away from them. Maybe one healthcare plan had your dependents covered and another didn't and suddenly i've lost and uh, one team has lost and they you know or you're just increasing your costs across the base so the, there's a lot of nuance in that part of it so that everyone job titles some one of the agencies we bought didn't have job titles they didn't really need them there was you know enough of them they all knew what they were doing now, we were a 600 person company and we had to have job titles because we had different people flying all over the world and they had to know seniority and who to talk to about what those things become really important in an integration plan and it's kind of a good idea to kind of agree that up front because the team has to feel good and you don't want them to you, you know you're buying an asset that has the, the all the assets you know all the people go home at night right and so and the clients can go 
So getting that right was really important. But I would say I, I think it's a fascinating process because you know what your agency is good at. You only know the way that you do it, right? We, this is the way we've done it and we've hired people in and we've made our process better. Yeah. But then you encounter agencies. They've got a completely orthogonal way of doing these things. Not better, not worse, just different. And how are we going to bring those together? It can be anything on like, hey, we don't measure time. We just don't like people filling in the same. And others are like, yeah, but we have to manage our capacity. And time sheets are absolutely critical to that. How are we going to reconcile those, th those completely different ways of pricing, ways of people working? And I think it's quite it's a good way to learn and, and it's quite humbling, really. You've got to just go in it with a learning mindset, but it's a, it was a brilliant opportunity. And uh, I learned a, a huge amount and I've taken some of those for, for, for Firebrand, but you know, you just meet some, some great people and there are all sorts of wonderful agencies out there that are different to yours and doing brilliantly that you shouldn't buy, but, but it's just great to meet them. And, you know, and I think it's a, it's a great process to go through. Yeah, that that's great, and I think you know there's there's a lot of agencies listening. Some might be in the the buying mode, or the bigger agencies. There's probably a lot more that could potentially be acquired. You know, that might be thinking about that yeah. in the next few years. I guess on the latter side for agencies that might be able yeah. to to be acquired, yeah. do you have any advice? Is there any commonalities that you saw from the better agencies that you're considering, or yeah. on the other hand, deal breakers, stuff that that they didn't get right that you were able to suss out and kind of take that big list and make it smaller, <laughs> much more quickly. Yes. Yes. So there is a certain size of agency. That, so number one, when a buyer is buying your agency, you as the owner, whoever the owners are, are going to get paid a certain amount of money. And then at some point will likely exit unless it's a kind of PE kind of roll up thing, right? But let's assume that that. So they are looking at your management team and they want to understand, okay, if you are not there because you've retired or whatever you've done, what have I got? Like, are you the rainmaker? Are you kicking every ball? Are you in every client call? Can it run without the principal? And so then everything needs to be structured under that. Like, okay, do they have processes? Do they do they have an org chart? It doesn't matter what the job titles, but is there an org chart? Is, you know, what, is this documented and a repeatable, scalable thing? Um, you very quickly realize if the finances are not buttoned down, right? The finances have to be good and you have to have good bit down growth and a good reason for, for that. You're not always going to grow. I mean, this year is going to be tough for agencies to grow, right? But, you know, a good reason for it. And then you're looking for what is the special thing that these guys have got that I can keep and then grow and implement across all my other clients? So do they do something I don't know, they've got a particular practice. Maybe they designed specific, specific types of website using Webflow, let's say. And everyone else, I can sell this to everybody else. It's going to be great. That's what you're kind of looking to do. And uh, and if they don't have that, and it's sort of, well, the clients sort of come from all different places and there's nothing really magical about that agency, then you're probably not going to be buyed. So therefore, as an owner, you've got to be thinking, right, my numbers have to be good. I have to have a good structure. I have to like processize this thing because someone else is going to come in here and I'm not going to be around and it has to run. And I want my team to be successful. This could be a great opportunity for your management team to go into a bigger firm and have great careers, right? They're going to have a bigger organization to run and be a senior people in. It's going to jump start them right up there. So set them up for that and set them up for that. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. That makes a lot of sense. Shifting gears a little bit, what if coming from the UK, you kind of talked about different cultures. How has that affected your perspective as a marketer? And does it give you any advantages against your American competitors? <laughs> I certainly think that having a British accent can sometimes sort of make you sound smarter than you really are. And I've sort of probably traded on that my whole career. I think, look, when I came here, I was in PR and so primarily. And so the media over here was bigger and behaved differently than the slightly more acerbic, sort of you know, slightly more cynical media that you had in the UK at the time. And that sort of evolved since then. I would say, look, it's a bigger market and that's why we came. I came here so that we could win business up here and then sort of sell it down across the UK and across Europe at the time strategically. So here is where the headquarters are. Here is where the innovation is happening. Here's the decisions are being made. 
within technology because most tech companies are US headquartered so to be the way it is. So that was the reason that I came. I, I become an American citizen. It's, a, it's an amazing country. And the, the way that people work, far more collaborative, very open, very welcoming for people coming in from other countries and, and cultures, despite what we might read in the media, media sometimes. This is a very welcoming environment. And I just reveled in that. And it's something that we try to replicate. And I think people are very open about what they want to do. They're very ambitious and they're very tolerant of failure. It's one of the things that has stood the country in such great stead, and particularly in the tech space most startups are going to fail. I mean, it's just the business model. You're shooting for the moon and not everybody's going to get there. So I think just to be part of that is just th thrilling in, you know, in a way that sometimes maybe in the UK, which I, you know, I, I moved here for opportunity, not because I don't love the UK, but it can be a little bit more ossified sometimes. And it's a smaller market. Everybody knows each other. So, you know, here's the bigger, yeah. it's a bigger, it's a bigger place. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess kind of getting towards the end of our time, uh, what what are you excited about? Like, what are you working on now over over the next few months? Like, what's what's getting you up in the morning? Well, look, we're in a tough time right now economically within the the, the startup market. So, what can you do during that time that you don't get the time to do when it's boom time and all you can do is try and hire people and keep them and deliver and onboard new clients like the, the when the rocket ship is flying you're just holding on now when the water's a bit calmer what are all the things that you wanted to do and so some of those things are basic sort of maintenance things that you you know I'm not going to leap out of bed in the morning to write standard operating procedures but they need to be written and we need to do the you know reviews and the training programs and all the things that you should do to ready yourself for the next phase that you're going to regret not having done. So, you know, doing your chores on uh, corporate chores on that, on that front, I think is a great time to sharpen our own marketing. So, you know, we have been launching new eBooks and content. We've launched our new podcast fired up. So I'm going to say that quickly, which is all about startup marketers, which we're having a lot of fun for, and we're making plans for, okay, how can an agency like us sort of be part of a bigger, a bigger community to sort of help our peers. We've been having guests in and other agencies to sort of help them and, you know, help our startup marketing friends get new jobs and hire then their team and get ready for that. And so we've got some plans on that front too. So it's all the things that you want. Plus, of course, look, AI, you know, we've talked about it, but every agency is thinking, how do we integrate this into our processes? You know, some people are experts at it. How do we make sure everybody comes up to the baseline of it? What what can we do? What's safe? What's not safe? Which tools should we use? So I'm sort of, and we have a team called Firebrand Labs that are doing that and publishing reports and finding it to my point about helping other people. We're busy working it out and publishing it when we find it, because I just think we can all learn from each other on that. So I'm personally pretty excited about this. You know, this is a tough time, but you do find that we've just celebrated our seventh anniversary. So we got this far. You do find, look, in a downturn, whether your clients are strong enough, like to my point about, are you doing a good job for your clients? Did you pick the right ones? Now's the time. Have you got the right team? Now's the time you find it because when things are going well, everyone looks successful. And everyone, you know, it's hard for clients to differentiate who's delivering great value. When things start to get a bit tougher, you really see who's performing and progress might not be so obvious on a revenue sheet or more people joining, but it is in terms of the practice that you're doing. And that's what we're really focused on so that we're ready when inevitably the next, the next phase comes. Yeah, that's that's great. And I look forward to kind of seeing how Fired Up and Firebrand Labs evolves. Hopefully we can maybe do a follow-up episode just to talk, just to geek out on the state of AI tools and what you guys are using. And yeah, I think that, that that's usually a hit. People like the gadgets. So I'll have to do that again. Yeah. And Morgan, where can people go to get in touch and follow what you're up to and all that good stuff? So my name's Morgan McClintic, M-C-L-I-N-T-I-C, -I -I and you can find me on LinkedIn. The agency is called Firebrand. It's firebrand.marketing. And the podcast is called Fired Up and firedup.show, or you can find it on our website. Those are the best places to reach me. I'd love to hear from any of you. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.
yeah, thanks for your time. Great to uh, catch up. Likewise.